So I'll just give you an introduction to Sister Sabine. Sister Sabine is one of the uh, directors at an amazing project that has been working with us for the last two years. You know, we, we've been doing online um, webinars, seminars with them. Um, and she is basically multi -talented. So she's a polymath. She's multi-talented. I think she's from a mechanical engineering background. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, she's a philosopher and an assistant professor. And she is a director in the second golden age. So I have told you golden ages about the golden age uh, what the Muslim Muslims golden age was. Their vision, Brother Faisal and Sister Sabrina, is to bring about the second golden age for the Muslims. So that's what the project is called. Uh, this year, I didn't restrict them on any topic. I said, whatever you would like, you share with us. So, um, and I think Brother Faisal's topic I got, which I think is freeing the Muslim mind. Um, and he will share that. But Sister Sabrina, um, over to you. Thank you so much. Bismillah, Azubillah, Amna, Shaitan, Rajeem. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wassalam ala Rasulihil Kareem. So firstly, thank you so much, Dr. Adil, for having us. And it's such an honor to be here. It's almost like a ritual that we have every year. And uh, we move on uh, and we sort of, you know, share whatever we've learned uh, this, uh, you know, uh, in the months uh, that have gone by. And Alhamdulillah, what a noble uh, project that you have here. May Allah give you success and happiness through it. Inshallah. So I'm going to be discussing uh, Iqbal, Atas, uh, and uh, the Islamization of education. So Alama Iqbal, obviously ev everyone in Pakistan is aware of, I don't really have to uh, introduce, but uh, Atas, Al-Atas, Naqib Al-Atas, I will introduce, and the Islamization of education. So uh, I was aware that Dr. Adil is very passionate about education and homeschooling. Uh, so we wanted to basically uh, contribute in a similar manner. Let's talk about how we can actually uh, make the education system today suitable to the Muslim mind, so suitable to the Muslim spirit. And uh, that is what I think these two people, in my opinion, Alama Iqbal and Naqib al Atas, are, you could say, the architects of uh, this movement of uh, an Islamic revival. So the agenda is uh, basically to understand the crisis of the Muslim Ummah, what is wrong, uh, understanding the concept of decline, what do we mean when we say that the Muslim Ummah is in decline? Ummat Muslima ka zawal. Uska matlab kya hai? Sayyid Muhammad Taqib al-Atas' concept of Islamization. To unka ye concept kya hai? Or many a times he calls it de-Westernization or de-secularization of education. As in our education today is on a completely secular, non-religious, non-Islamic, and Western model, which is completely against our values. So we want to be talking about those things. And Alama Iqbal's concept of the gulam, the enslaved Muslim mind, and his call for reconstruction. So his famous book, everyone must be aware of his book, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. So reconstructing the uh, Islamic education system in the dark era of secularization. We have to realize the kind of world, the world that we are in, and the dominant philosophies of this world. So I'm just going to take this here. Now, let's define decline. What do we mean by zawal? Ummat muslima ka zawal, uska matlab kya hai? A nation is said to be in a state of crisis. This is a definition that I came up with, uh, reading many uh, other you know, scholars and their works. So a nation is said to be in a state of crisis or decline when it fails to represent the ideals and values for which it was created in the first place. So you came into existence because of certain ideals and values, and now you're not you are recognized by those values and by those ideals. So it would be said that you are in a state of crisis and you're in a state of decline. So Islam started with a call to read and gain knowledge, which was Iqra, 
بسم ربك الذي خلق so the early muslim community was an intellectual community we know that there were very few people who were literate when islam started and by the time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam reached uh, his fine, final age there were hundreds or even thousands of muslims who were uh, hufaz of the quran they were memorizers they were literate and they knew extremely sophisticated uh, issues about education about society about governance so within 23 years there's a there's a revolution the islamic civilization brought about the biggest intellectual revolution in human history but now let's ask the question where is the umma uh, muslim umma today in education nowhere so we can say that we are in a state of serious crisis and decline Now let me introduce you to Sayyid Muhammad Naqib Al Atas if you're not aware he is a very famous uh, Malaysian scholar and uh, uh, Naqib Al Atas's views he's actually famous for this uh, for coining this term islamization of knowledge islamization this term now his views he views the crisis at, uh, affect in the muslim world as an intellectual crisis he says the actual crisis jo hum upar upar se dekhte hain you know the things that we see okay the economic crisis or the political crisis or the war there or the occupation there those are the visible forms of the crisis but the actual crisis is the intellectual crisis as in we don't even know who we are so he terms this crisis to be a de-islamization we have we have moved away from uh, the ideals of islam we don't recognize uh, ourselves with those ideals we don't even know them or he calls it westernization of islam he talks about the westernization of christianity before that happened in his book a uh, very famous book uh, islam and secularism and he also talks about the westernization of islam or the secularization this this movement of secularization that we are seeing in the world today now islam and muslims have been moved far away from the values ideals and the world view of the quran by a concerted effort of secularization according to him so it's a concerted effort of removing religion of removing the idea of god of removing the idea of sacred of removing the idea of values from life in in uh, like in general from every sphere of life and we are stuck in that uh, in this crisis so he says in his book islam and secularism he says the in integral components in the dimensions of secularization are number 1 the disenchantment of nature i'm going to dis- describe what that is the desacralization of politics number 2 number 3 is the deep consecration of values these three things have happened and that is the uh, if we could define the crisis of the muslim world is just these three things that have happened so he says the disenchantment of nature as in what that that means is freeing the study of nature as in the physical sciences you study physics you study biology you study chemistry but you study it free from religious overtones or the god centered philosophy of science this is the birth of secular science that backs new atheism agnosticism and doubts about the ultimate reality so you're studying i'm an engineer i've studied science for as long as i can remember uh that kind of science was completely free from god from se- the uh, sec- uh, yeah, sacred uh, uh, view about nature from the metaphysical dimensions of uh, the world so that is called secular science obviously all of us when we study science we study in it in a completely secularized way this he calls the disenchantment of nature like nature was supposed to be uh, the biggest sign of god but now we study nature as something to do nothing something that does nothing with god has no relation whatsoever with god so that he recognizes as one of the elements of this uh, intellectual crisis in the umma and obviously we know now know atheism agnosticism all of these different movements that are completely against the islamic world view are a result of this particular uh, movement the disenchantment of nature all atheists uh whenever you talk to them they have a, a, a an extremely scientific tone in their 
language as if science has replaced uh, religion. According to them, it has. According to us, it hasn't. So uh, the other dimension of this um, secularization or de-Islamization is the de-sacralization of politics. When politics is completely separate from uh, values, from the sacred, or what Allama Iqbal says, uh, so that's it. Siyasat and deen are completely, politics and religion are completely separate. And that is the desacralization of politics. Uh, the abolition of sacral legitimation of political power and authority, political and economic power in Islam has to rest on the foundations of the Quran. And it's born out of the shura, the consultation of the Muslim community. So if we see in the world today, the political systems throughout the world, they have nothing to do with this kind of a model. Deconsecration of values. Uh, we have the rendering transient and relative all religious value systems and worldviews, thus making future open to change and man free to create the change. So what we have today, you hear these things. Uh, these look very technical, but we hear the softer tones in movies, in in uh, on uh, media, where people say that, you know, uh, gender is something that you can, let's say, define yourself. Uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, realize gender as you grow. So that's all coming from this view where you have a complete removal of value systems. Now, you, in, uh, the human being is considered as completely free to create his or her own values. Uh, you can create your own gender. You can create your own moral right, moral wrong. You're free to create whatever you want to create. And that's a result of the deep consecration of values. Her Halal being made into haram, haram being made into halal. So his solution, Sayyid Muhammad Nakib al solution to this crisis is simple. He says the Islamization of all knowledge, basically a return back to the Islamic principles and values that we always had from day one. So the Prophet wasallam. That is what his mission was. If we could use this term there, the Prophet ﷺ Islamized everything. Uh, whatever was positive, he accepted. Whatever was negative and it could be um, altered, he altered. Whatever was completely negative, he rejected. And that was the Islamization that happened in the prophetic time. So Islamization is the liberation of man from magical, mythological, animistic, national, cultural traditions opposed to Islam. So all of these things uh, that are opposed to Islam, whether they come from culture or from mythology or from nationalism or from uh, beliefs of, um, you know, uh, animism or any sort of an ideology, if they're opposed to Islam, that is, you know, we have to liberate ourselves from those worldviews. And then from the secular control over man's reason and language. So this is our task today. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi in his time did the earlier part of Islamization, liberation of the human being from magical, mythological, animistic, national, cultural tradition. But now our uh, task is to free uh, our uh, practice of our religion from the secular control over uh, man's reason and language. Now, moving on now to Alama Iqbal, uh, because we are talking about these two architects of an Islamic revival. Uh, so you cannot ignore uh, the, uh, you know, the beautiful contributions of Alama Iqbal and his diagnosis. Firstly, let's go to his diagnosis of the crisis of the Ummah. So he says beautifully in his poetry, So this is his uh, understanding of the total complete state of crisis and uh, the decline in which the Muslim Ummah is, where he says, O oh, morning breeze, convey my message to uh, the Prophet ﷺ, who was, you know, Kamli Wale, as in he would wrap himself with the, uh, you know, shawl. And uh, the Ummah, he says, the Ummah has lost both the deen and the dunya. So we are nowhere in the dunya as well. There's nowhere you can see a Muslim society that is prosperous on its own, on its own, uh, in the dunya. 
so prospering in the dunya. The prosperous Muslim nations that we see, if you go deeper, they're not really prospering on their own. They have the Western support with them. And deen to gayahi, you know, uh, the principles of the uh, deen are, you know, uh, lost almost. The spirit is lost and many a times even the word is lost. He says, uh, part of his diagnosis also includes that he says that the ummah is enslaved and he uses the specific term of gulami of enslavement. He says that the Ummah is enslaved physically, mentally, economically, politically, spiritually. He literally views the state of the Ummah as being one of total enslavement. In various ways, he presents this. And it's not just the colonial period that he's talking about. He's talking about the enslavement of the mind, of the spirit, of uh, the of every facet of the Muslim life. So he says, uh, even talking about the most intimate part of uh, the human experience, which is your spirituality. He says, In the sense, your heart, when, whenever I put my head down on the ground, uh, even I could hear from the ground the sound that your heart contains um, your heart is dedicated to other than Allah, what are you going to get from this salah? So this means that materialism and the ideologies of uh, the time have taken over even the hearts and the minds of Muslims. So this is his concept of gulami that is recurrent throughout his poetry, throughout his philosophical works, where he says, gulami mein na kaam aati hai shamshire na tadbire, jo ho zauke yaki paida to kat jati hai in the sense you can have as many strategies as you want and you can have as many weapons and ammunition as you want as long as you are not free they are all a waste because you will use them for the master you won't use them for your own benefit so the first things first we have to recognize that the muslim ummah is in a state of enslavement it hasn't changed since his time uh, there is, uh, you know, we had Independence Day and we do have all of that. But is the mind, Muslim mind free? Is the Muslim spirit free? Uh, are we thinking free? Is our education system free? Those are the questions that we need to ask. So what is his solution to the crisis? Uh, throughout his work, it, it just resonates with one thing. He, number one, according to Alama Iqbal, the solution is istihkam e khudib that he calls the fortification, the strengthening of the self, of yourself, of myself. And he says that we have the potential in us. In all of his works, he's just putting in that confidence in the Muslim mind and heart that you have the potential in you. It's in you. You can change not only yourself, you can change the destiny of your nation. You can change the destiny of the world. He says your ancestors changed the world. I'm just paraphrasing much of his poetry that your ancestors changed the world. Can you not break the shackles around you? That's the core of his message there. But then he doesn't just leave us there to our own selves. He says, what's the path? What's the training ground of this uh, fortification of the self, of your own nafs, of your own uh, khudi? He says that's the tawhi. That's where la ilaha illallah comes into uh, the picture as a training ground. He says... Yourself is like a sword and the millstone which sharpens the sword is Tawheed. And if we think about it, absolutely we can resonate with that. The more a person reflects on the power and the majesty and uh, the absolute authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you enslave yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and free yourself from the shackles of society, of the times, of your own base desires. So Tawheed is the way of freeing the, new, the Muslim mind from the shackles that uh, we find ourselves in. And he says that the Quran, according to Alama Iqbal, the Quran is an infinite source of knowledge from which every generation takes its share. 
it's it's not a finite source. It's an infinite source. Every generation comes and takes its share without reducing anything from the Quran. So according to him, it would be, you know, we have to stop thinking that the classical scholarship exhausted the knowledge of the Quran. In sense, this view of uh, that the classical scholarship have done uh, what had to be done. They have developed the knowledge. And all now we have to do is memorize what they did. And that's it. We don't think we close this mind and we just uh, follow from the classical scholarship. According to Alama Iqbal, that is death. Mm, uh, you know, uh, ki se to hai you know, he says suicide is better than blind following. He says uh, to have a succession of identical thoughts and feelings is to have no thoughts and feelings at all. Such is the lot of mo most Muslim countries today. They are mechanically repeating old values. So for him, the important things, then the important solutions to this crisis is we have to revive critical thinking in our education system that is fikr, tafakkur, tadabbur, this idea of critically analyzing every subject that we are studying. The students have to be infused with this habit of asking questions, why, how, what, and thinking about critical solutions. So for him, that is why ijtihad or the effort to reason was so important. And it's, it's so amazing that we have have such a for uh you know uh, this this quranic message of thinking critically thinking that's you read the quran there is not a page in the quran that does not invite you to reflection to thinking and critically analyzing knowledge coming from other sources than Islam and incorporating the suitable elements. So Alama Iqbal's views and even the views of earlier scholars, our classical scholarship, they were never averse to uh, knowledge that came from other sources, the way we find our ulama today. So we have to be open, but we have to critically analyze and then we incorporate the suitable elements because knowledge is the property of Allah. And the human being, the uh, believer, is, uh, you know, uh, is always in uh, seeking, is always, uh, you know, has this mission of seeking beneficial knowledge. So with keeping all of that in mind, what does the Islamic education look like, system look like now? We have uh, Nakiba Latas's view, we have Alama Iqbal's view. Number one, our Islamic education system, our education system, which would be Islamized. I'm not just talking about the Alimia course or your Islamic studies course. I'm talking about studying biology, mathematics, physics from the Islamic point of view. That's what I'm talking about. That has to be Allah centric, God centric. So Tawheed would be the foundational principle. So in such an education system, when you would do your BSc in physics, let's say, or you would study physics in high school, this idea of random mutation in biology or random fluctuations in physics would not be present. That means we need a complete rethinking of the system. There is nothing random in a God, in an Allah centric universe. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a teleology as we say. So there's a moral order behind the historical process. Our students would be infused with these ideas that nations rise and fall, not because of lack of resources or other factors. There is a moral order. Nations are destroyed. Nations are overcome and overwhelmed because there is a moral order in place in the environment, in uh, the historical process. This is how history would be taught. This is how anthropology would be taught in, uh, you know, uh, Muslim societies. This is how uh, sociology should be taught. And the unity of knowledge, the two book theory, the universe has ayat. What's the two book theory? The universe has ayat, just like the Quran has ayat. So if you read the uh, Quran, it says, don't you reflect on the ayat of the universe. So the universe and the Quran are two revelations of Allah. There are two kinds of revelations. You could say two books that have come from Allah. So if we actually reflect on that, that means there should be no demarcation between science and the sacred. Everything can be studied by the lens of science, 
uh, you know, the whole universe is a subject matter for science, but everything scientific is also sacred. And this is how uh, things were in the golden age of Islam. There was no as such demarcation between science and secular sciences, uh, you know, religious sciences and secular sciences. They were all studied within a common uh, intellectual milieu. So that means the whole system has to be revised. I mean, think about it. I've studied all my life in secular institutions and I have not really, you know, encountered this. That means the entire system has to be revised. And so the task is mammoth. And in my opinion, the ulama cannot do it. For some reason, the ulama first have to be convinced into what has to be done. And first, we'll have to have that discussion. If they understand, then maybe, yes, they can. Otherwise, I don't think it's the job of the educationists as well. Because if they understood the issue, we wouldn't really have the problem in the first place. We would have had an Islamized education system. So who's going to do the job? You and I have to do the job. Uh, as Alama Iqbal says, Kirat ko gulami se azad kar. Free your intellect from this slavery. Jawano ko piro ka ustad kar. So it's the youth who are bearing the brunt of this secularization, this westernization, this de-Islamization, we are going to uh, get the change. We know things better than even, uh, you know, our scholarship at times. And the youth uh, could, you know, they can do this. But how do we do this? Because the this one approach is the uh, up-down approach. That's where you go to the governments, the institutions, the resources have to be allocated. A lot of work has to be done. But the easier approach is the bottom-up approach, which we can start from today, which is something that we can uh, incorporate in homeschooling, which is something that we can incorporate in our uh, you know, own families where we're, we're teaching our children how to view the world with this uh, a perspective. And that means that women's education is critical because it's going to be the women who are going to be handling most of homeschooling and most of this uh, so, sort of an Islamized education system. So that means it's the women, the Muslim women have to be educated in this. So this is, uh, you know, uh, our view of the Islamization of the education uh, system today, inshallah, let's hope and pray that it actually becomes a reality. And I think we don't really have to wait because if we are going with the bottom up approach, we can actually start from today, from our own homes, from our own education. So thank you so much for having me. I hope we all benefited, inshallah.